Hi, Chem 101 students, and welcome back for our third and final lecture for this week. Uh, so in this lecture, uh, we're going to go more in depth on different types of double replacement reactions. So in the last lecture, we talked about all different types of reactions, uh, the ways in describing them, uh, talking about the ways in which the atoms change which other atoms they're bonded to. And we also talked about oxidation and reduction. In this lecture, we're going to focus in particular on double replacement reactions and the different types. We're going to talk about uh, whether uh, the solubility of ionic compounds in water, and so whether certain compounds are soluble in water and others aren't. And then we're going to use that to talk about a type of double replacement reaction called a precipitation reaction, in which you mix uh, solutions in which there are two ionic compounds dissolve, but when you mix the solution, a ionic compound that is not soluble in water is formed, and then that becomes a solid, and that solid is referred to as the precipitate. Uh, we'll move on then to neutralization reactions, which involve the reactions of what are known as acids, that you learned how to name last week, and bases, which are uh, generally uh, hydroxide compounds, or compounds containing the polyatomic ion hydroxide. And finally, we'll talk about gas evolution reactions. So sometimes when you mix two solutions uh, that have ionic compounds dissolved in them, they will produce something that will go on to produce gaseous molecules. You may have seen this if you've seen uh, vinegar and baking soda mixed. It produces bubbles, and that's an example of a gas evolution reaction. So let's start by talking about ionic compounds and what happens when they dissolve in water. So as you know from last week's lectures and, and practice, ionic compounds are made of positive and negative ions. So here is an example ionic compound uh, sodium chloride. So it has positive sodium ions and negative chloride ions here. And when an ionic compound, this is by the way, sodium chloride is table salt. So when you put table salt in water, it dissolves very, very easily, very readily. You just stir it up and it dissolves. And the reason why is that for reasons that we're going to talk about later, water molecules are, are polar, meaning they have a side that has a more positive charge and a side that has a more negative charge. Now we've talked about how strongly the atoms pull on electrons, and we said those atoms that are at the top right of the periodic table pull on electrons the hardest. And oxygen is very close to the top right of the periodic table. So in a water molecule, the oxygen atoms are positioned in, in this V shape here uh, relative to the hydrogen atoms. So you get a V shape like this. And so the side of the water molecule where the oxygen is has, a, has more electron density. There's more electrons around this area because oxygen pulls on electrons harder than hydrogen does. And so the electrons that are whoops, involved in making this bond are pulled towards the oxygen and you get a negative side to the water molecule here. However, on the other side, it will be lacking in electrons. And so this will give it a partial positive charge. And that partial positive charge is indicated by this small lowercase delta here, a uh, Greek delta letter, and a positive. And so the hydrogen side of the water molecule becomes attracted to the negative ions in the, uh, in the ionic compound here, sodium chloride, and begins to tug on them. And they get pulled off, uh, and so this is what's going on microscopically. The, the chloride ions get pulled off by the positive side of the water, and then once they're off and floating around in the water, they can be surrounded by, uh, by the, the positive side of neighboring water molecules. Likewise, the negative side of the water molecule where the oxygen is, indicated by this small lowercase uh, Greek delta with a negative sign here, those are attracted to the positive ions in the ionic compound. And so those tug on the positive ions till they get jiggled loose and then finally, once those positive ions are free in the water, then they are surrounded by uh, the oxygen side of water molecules. <clears throat> we call this the hydrolysis of aqueous ionic compounds. Hydro here, referring to water, 
and lysis meaning break. So the ionic compound, its ions are being broken apart by interacting with the water. So we call that hydrolysis. And when they have completely come off, we say that they're hydrolyzed in the water. And, uh, and then they get separated. And now these ions are floating around all independently in the, in, the, uh, in the solution. And so we call that mixture now a solution. And the ions are, are no longer in chunks like this. They're all floating around freely in the water and moving around in the water. So that's what happens when ionic compounds dissolve. So because these ions are all free and moving around, what it means is that they'll, they're going to bump into other ions that are around, floating around in the water as well. And so what we see here is an example of what happens, what can happen when certain ions bump into each other and end up sticking. <clears throat> and so, just a moment. So here uh, we have in this top beaker a solution of potassium iodide. And so the potassium iodide is dissolved in the water. So we can see that the potassium ions are floating around separately from the iodide ions. And they can move all around in this solution and travel all over the place in here. In the bottom beaker is another clear solution. This has lead 2 nitrate in it. So the uh, green ions here are representing the lead 2 plus ions. And then these ions here are the polyatomic ions, nitrate. Now, so both of these are, are ionic compounds that are soluble in water, that you can see that they've dissolved in water. And so um, the, the ions are freely floating around here, and in this beaker here, the ions are freely floating around, and we don't see any solids in here. Uh, because these are dissolved in water, we say that they are aqueous. AQ means aqueous meaning dissolved in water. But when we mix them, immediately we start to see a yellow solid forming. And if we leave this for a while, the yellow solid will settle to the bottom of the beaker. Now what's happening here is once you mix these two solutions, then you have all four of these types of ions now floating around in this solution. But it turns out that when a lead ion encounters uh, iodide ions, these form a compound that is not soluble in water. It's lead to iodide. And that is the, what that yellow solid is that you're seeing there. That's lead to iodide. Now the potassium and the nitrate, these ions do not form uh, an insoluble compound. They are soluble. And so you can see that the potassium ions, which are represented by the blue spheres here, and the nitrate ions are still aqueous. They're still dissolved in water. So those are still freely moving around all around here in the solution. But what's happened here is that the lead and iodide ions have now all stuck to one another and have made this chunky solid, which you see on the bottom there. And so if this is what's known as a precipitation reaction. So we think of precipitation oftentimes when we hear the weather. So there's going to be some precipitation in the atmosphere. That means there's going to be liquid or liquid drops of water or solid snowflakes coming down from the atmosphere. Uh, that's also precipitation. You've got a liquid or a solid coming out of the air solution. Here what we have are solids coming out of the liquid solution. So it's the same word kind of describing the same thing there. So the question is, well, okay, so lead to iodide is something that will not dissolve in water. And so that's why it comes out as this chunky solid. So how can we know if uh, a combination of ions are going to produce something that will be a solid? And to know this, we're going to use what are known as the ionic solubility rules. And so these are some rules that tell us for a great number of ionic compounds, whether they will be sol soluble in water or not. Uh, it's, in, and it's important to note that solubility is like, it, we're going we're gonna to classify ionic compounds as either soluble or not soluble. But some ionic compounds are very, very extremely soluble, and, and they will, a lot of them will dissolve like salt. You can dissolve a lot of salt in water table salt, sodium chloride. 
Other compounds will dissolve a little bit in water, but not that much. And some will basically not dissolve in water at all. There's a whole spectrum here to this. But we're going to draw a line somewhere in the middle. And it's important to note that if you look up ionic solubility rules online, you'll probably find a few different variations, especially for the kind of borderline cases where things are kind of soluble. Uh, so not, not all ionic solubility rules from every textbook are exactly the same as one another. Uh, so what I'm going to ask you to do is follow what I've told you in the slides. I give you kind of the most simplistic, easy to remember solubility rules here. Uh, and, and I do expect you to, to memorize them at least to a certain extent, or to at least have them in your notes very closely available so you can refer to them whenever you need to. Uh, and this is going, the solubility rules are generally the last thing I tell my students you must, must memorize besides, you know, vocabulary words here and there. Uh, because you're going to be using them so often to decide if you're going to get a product that does not dissolve in water in one of your reactions here. So um, when it comes to ionic solubility rules, we're going to identify them based on what ions are present. And if these ions are present in an ionic compound, this will indicate an ionic compound that will be soluble no matter what. So these include ions in group one, including lithium, sodium, potassium, rubidium, and so forth. Uh, so if it has a group one positive ion in the ionic compound, that ionic compound is considered soluble. If an ammonium ion is the positive ion, so this is our one and only positive polyatomic ion, if there's an ammonium ion in, in the uh, ionic compound or salt, as they're often also called ionic compounds, these will be soluble. If the ionic compound contains an acetate ion, it will be always soluble. Or a nitrate ion, it will be soluble. So if you see these ions, if you see an ionic compound that has one of these ions in it, that ionic compound will always be soluble. Next, these are ionic compounds that are usually soluble in water with some exceptions. So if you have a halide besides fluoride, chloride, bromide, and iodide, if you have one of those ions in your ionic compound, then the ionic compound is usually soluble, except for if the positive ion is a few different ions here, including silver, lead-2, and mercury-1. If you have uh, one of those ions, then that ionic compound is not soluble. Otherwise, it is. So chlorides and bromides and iodides are usually soluble unless it's silver chloride, lead-2 chloride, or mer mercury-1 chloride, or you know, lead to br or silver bromide, lead to bromide, uh, silver iodide, lead to iodide, so forth. If there is a sulfate ion in your ionic compound, then it will usually be soluble too, with a few exceptions. These include calcium sulfate, strontium sulfate, barium sulfate, lead to sulfate. Now I will say that there's an easy way to memorize the calcium, strontium, and barium. These are all a part of group two. So let's go ahead and go to our handy dandy periodic table here, just to check that out. So calcium, strontium, and barium are right here. And these sulfates are not soluble in water. And so uh, this is an easy way to memorize that, uh, is that those calcium, strontium, and barium are all close to one another in group two. So sulfates are generally soluble except for calcium, strontium, and barium sulfate, and also lead to sulfate. So those are the if, if any of those ionic compounds are contained in, or ions are contained in the ionic compound, then the ionic compound is usually soluble. Which compounds are not very soluble or not soluble? Almost all carbonates and phosphates are insoluble, except when they're with the ions that make them always soluble. This includes uh, the, you know, any of the always soluble ions, including group one, positive ions, and ammonium ions. 
So those would be soluble, but otherwise these are not soluble. Sulfides are generally insoluble. Uh, only if there's group one or group two metal ions, uh, so like calcium sulfide or lithium sulfide. So these have group one and calcium is a group two metal, lithium is a group one metal. So sulfides are generally soluble except when they have group one or group two metal ions. Finally, hydroxides are also generally not soluble unless they're with one of the always soluble ions such as group one and also calcium, strontium, and barium. So hy hydroxides are generally not soluble, but calcium hydroxide is soluble and strontium hydroxide is soluble and barium hydroxide is soluble. So now we can use these to decide which ionic compounds are soluble. And so I'm just gonna actually show all of these and I'll say, why don't you, uh, if you're following along this video, I encourage you to pause the video and to look back at the rules I just gave you and try to identify based on these rules whether these ionic compounds are soluble or not soluble. So I'm going to go ahead and pause the video now and I'll start up in just a moment after you unpause. Okay, let's decide whether these are soluble or not. So this, uh, this ionic compound uh, contains potassium ions, and I'm just gonna write the ions it contains over on the side. It has two potassium ions and it has a carbonate ion. So carbonate ions are generally not soluble, but if potassium is a group one metal ion, so any compound that has a group one metal positive ion is soluble. So potassium carbonate is soluble in water. Now we have silver bromate, bromide that contains silver ions and bromide ions. Now generally bromides are soluble but there are some exceptions. Let's go back and look at the rules real, real quick. Bromides are generally soluble, but silver chloride, silver bromide are not. So this is an exception here. So silver bromide is not soluble, or we would say it's insoluble. You can say either one. So not soluble, or the other way of saying that is insoluble. Uh, and then finally, iron 3 sulfate. Uh, so you should be able to figure out what ions are in here. Uh, we got three sulfate ions. Sulfate ions are 2 minus. Hopefully after last week you've got that memorized. And I'm writing down three of them because I've got three of them right here. So that gives me a total of six negative charges. I've got two irons. I know because a 2 was written right here. And in order for my charges to balance out, to have six positives and my six negatives, each of these must have positive three charge. So this is iron three along with sulfate. Uh, sulfates are generally soluble, and there are a few exceptions. So sulfates are soluble. Let's go back to the sulfate. So sulfates are generally soluble except calcium, strontium, barium, and lead two. Well, iron 3 sulfate is not one of the exceptions, so this sulfate is soluble. So this is going to be soluble. Okay, and so we've been able to decide which compounds are soluble and which are not. And so that's how you use the solubility rules here. So Given these solubility rules, now we can tell which combinations of ions are going to give us an insoluble ionic compound. So that allows us to predict the, uh, the, the result of a precipitation reaction. So right here in this example, I have written down an example of a precipitation reaction here. It is a kind of double replacement reaction. We can see here because 
the magnesium was with the chloride to start, but then it switched places and it went with the carbonate. And the lithium was with the carbonate, but then it switched places and it went with the chloride here. And uh, this equation is balanced. I've already balanced it. But what I want to point out is that both of our reactants were aqueous. So these were both soluble in water. Let's double check these. Chlorides are generally soluble, right? And uh, the, the exceptions are silver chloride, lead 2 chloride, and mercury 1 chloride. So magnesium chloride is not an exception. So this is soluble, and that's why we have an aqueous here. Aqueous means that it's dissolved in water. Now carbonates are generally not soluble, but lithium is a group one metal. So since lithium is a group one metal, then this compound must be soluble. Any ionic compound with a group one metal is soluble. So that's why you see an aqueous here. Likewise, lithium chloride here uh, contains both chloride, which is usually soluble, and it has a group one metal ion. So of course this one is soluble as well. So you can see that we've labeled it aqueous. Now let's go to the magnesium carbonate. So magnesium carbonate contains carbonate, and carbonates are generally not soluble unless they're with an ion that makes them all use soluble like group one or ammonium. Magnesium is not one of those. So this is insoluble. And because it's insoluble, that's how we know it's going to make a solid here. So this is a precipitation reaction. In a precipitation reaction, you mix solutions that contain two soluble ionic compounds, and then an insoluble ionic compound comes out of the solution. So reactions are so these reactions are done when the reactants are dissolved in water or aqueous. This usually leads to very fast uh, reactions that that go very easily because all of the ions are dissolved in water. They're hydrolyzed, so they can be moving all around in the water, so they can bump into one another and react with one another. Uh, this is a double replacement reaction, and uh, an insoluble product can can be produced from this reaction. And when an insoluble product is produced, we call that a precipitation reaction. So to know whether the product is going to be insoluble or not, whether it's going to be a solid, we need to use the solubility rules to decide. Now, <clears throat> uh, when we write this out, there are other ways to write it out so we can see actually what ions are dissolved in the water. We call these ionic equations. So in ionic equations, what we do is we take any uh, ionic compounds that are aqueous and we write the ions out separately because since they're floating around separately in water it makes sense to write them out separately because they're in, when they're dissolved they're no longer stuck together in an ionic compound and so if we're if we're uh, dealing with this this right here first of all we can predict what the products will be. This is a double replacement reaction. So here's the way we do this. We want to identify what are the ions in the compound. So we look at magnesium and we see, oh, magnesium, okay. This is a metal, so this is an ionic compound, and it's a uh, fixed charge metal in group two here. I'll erase this. So it's in group two. And just reminding ourselves here, remember group one makes positive one ions, group two makes positive two ions, group three metals make positive three ions, these do not make ions, group five makes negative three ions, group six makes negative two ions, group seven makes negative one ions, and these do not make ions. Okay, so magnesium is in group two, so in an ionic compound it's going to be a positive two ion. Whoops. There. Okay, and so we would identify the ion in here. It's Mg2+. The negative ion is a monatomic negative ion with the chlorine atom. So we could check out what its charge would be. 
it's on the periodic table, it's in group seven, so it makes ions with negative one charge, and that's why there are two of them here in this compound. Now, on the, for the lithium here, lithium is a metal, and it's in group one, so this is an ionic compound where the lithium ion is positive one, and we've got two of them, it looks like. We can tell by that subscript too, so we can write them both out just to know that. Uh, and then finally, uh, we're making, uh, our other ion is clearly a polyatomic ion, and so this one we have to have up here in our head. Hopefully you remember what this is after last week. We're really, really building off of last week, as you can tell here. This is a carbonate ion. And what we've got here is a double replacement reaction, which means that each of these ions switches partners. So in the products, the positive ion here is going to go with the negative ion in the other compound. And the negative ion in this compound is going to go, is going to go with the positive ion in the other. And so when we write the formula, so later on we're going to have to predict what these products would be. And so what we do is we write out the ions that make this compound. So uh, here would have magnesium two plus ions. So that's the positive ion in this compound. And we'd have for the negative ion, we'd have the carbonate ion. So we'd put CO3 two minus here. An important note, what we have down here is our work. Okay, this is work. This is not part of our answer. This is our work, okay? So this should not be in your answer. This is just off to the side or underneath somewhere where we're figuring out how many ions we've got, okay? So as we can see though, magnesium is positive two and carbonate is negative two. And so that's why we have one magnesium and one carbonate. Now what, here's what's really important. On this other compound here, We've got a lithium positive one, that's our positive ion right here, and chloride negative one. And so here our charges are already canceling. Lithium positive one, chloride negative one. That's why we write LiCl. We do not write not Li2Cl2. Do not write that. That is not an ionic compound. You always use the smallest numbers here. The way that we make sure that we have the right number of atoms at the end is we balance. And that's why finally we put a two here because that will balance our lithiums and chlorines. Here we have one times two, two chlorines, and one times two, two lithiums. Okay, we got two lithiums and two chlorines on the right, as you can see there, or on the left rather. So on the right, what we do is we add the two to balance this reaction, but we do not write the twos as subscripts here. So that is incorrect. It only takes one lithium ion to balance charges with one chloride ion. And we fix the imbalance by balancing. Notice what I did. The balancing happens at the very end after we're, we're sure that we have all of our subscripts correct. And the subscripts here are one, not two. Because there's no point in balancing an equation if the subscripts are wrong, because then you can't balance anyway. So make sure you've written the formulas for each ionic, uh, ionic equation correctly, or sorry, ionic formula correctly. Then lastly, you can balance. Finally, uh, deciding what will be solid here, the magnesium carbonate is solid because carbonates are generally insoluble and magnesium carbonate is no exception. The lithium chloride is soluble because chlorides are generally soluble and lithium is, uh, lithium is a group one ion that makes its compound always soluble. So this is what's referred to as the molecular equation. It's the total equation where the ions are all stuck together. But realistically, when the ions are dissolved in water and they're aqueous, as we saw in the picture, those ions are no longer stuck together. So we can write the, how we can write them instead is to write them as completely separate ions that are not stuck to each other at all. 
This is referred to as the total ionic equation. So we can look at our work here to decide what the total ionic equation would be. The total ionic equation, if we're writing out all the ions, on the left side it would have one magnesium ion, it would have two chloride ions, it would have two separate lithium ions, these are no longer connected, it would have one carbonate ion, then on the right side these would not be separate ions. Since this is a solid, we would say these are stuck together. So these ones here, they're stuck together, okay, they're stuck together, uh, and they do not, they're not separate as ions. However, these ions are separate. We'd have two separate lithium ions. We can write them out if we wish. Just make sure, again, not to write the formula wrong. So we'll have two separate lithium ions here and two separate chloride ions. So the way to write the total ionic equation is like this. We write the one magnesium ion right here. We say it's aqueous. We write two separate chloride ions. So see how we put the two in front here? What this is saying is that we know that these chloride ions and these magnesium ions are no longer stuck to one another because the magnesium chloride is dissolved in water. So all the ions have been hydrolyzed and they're all floating around separately. We've got two separate lithium ions. Again, the two in front is telling us these lithium ions are now separate. See the difference here? This is two subscript. This means that the chloride and magnesium ions are all stuck together. But when we're writing the total ionic equation, we're trying to represent that these ions are not associated or stuck with each other at all. So that's why we put the two out in front here. These lithium ions are not stuck together actually because they're aqueous, dissolved in water. And so they're all just floating around all separately. Finally, we have one carbonate ion, which is also aqueous. But when we get to the magnesium carbonate, because we know that's solid, we know that the magnesium and carbonate ions are stuck together. So it's not appropriate to write them separately. They're not separate. They're stuck in a pile. Going back to the picture we saw earlier with the lead iodide, do you see the difference here? These ions are all aqueous. They're all separate and floating around. But here, for the lead 2 iodide, these ions are stuck together. So it's not appropriate to write them as being separate and floating around in water, because they're not. They're stuck together. And the way to write them stuck, stuck together is PbI2. In the case of the magnesium carbonate, the magnesium and carbonate ions are stuck together. So we write them as stuck together as a solid. However, the lithium chloride is aqueous, so we've got two separate chloride ions floating around and two separate lithium ions. So this is called the ionic, or often also called the uh, total ionic equation. So we've written all of the ions as separate uh, floating around in water. Now what you'll notice is that for some of these ions, they actually were never really involved in any reaction. These include the chloride ions, they were aqueous and floating around at first, and at the end, they're still aqueous and floating around. Nothing has changed for them. The same is true for the lithium. Okay, the lithium ions were aqueous, they were just floating around freely at first. They're still aqueous, they're still floating around. So what we can do is when we want to write the uh, what really happened in the reaction, the only thing that changed is the magnesium ions bumped into carbonate ions and got stuck together and made magnesium carbonate. So when we identify what went unchanged in both sides of the reaction, we can get rid of those and write what's known as the net ionic equation. And we remove the spectator ions. So the spectator ions here in this reaction were the chloride and the lithium ions. These are the spectator, spectator ions here. That's these guys here. These were spectators. They did not do anything. So they're called spectators because it's like they're watching the action happen and not doing anything themselves. What really happened was the magnesium ions stuck to the carbonate ions and made the solid magnesium carbonate. And so these are referred as the total ionic equation and the net ionic equation. And oftentimes it's useful to write the net ionic equation because it's cleaner. You can see what's really happening to the ions. Uh, in which ions are just spectating. <clears throat> One issue, the reason why we don't always write the net ionic equation is because 
you can't just go to the store or the stock room at, at San Bernardino Valley College and buy a bottle of magnesium ions. You can't buy a bottle of any ions. The ions always have to come as a part of a neutral ionic compound. So like you can bottle, buy a bottle of magnesium chloride and dissolve it in water, but that is a neutral ionic compound because the charges, positive and negative, are canceling. You can also go buy a bottle of lithium carbonate. Uh, again, it's a neutral ionic compound. The positive and negative charges cancel. But you can't go and find a bottle of magnesium ions or a bottle of carbonate ions. These would instantly react with anything they were around to make something new. Uh, ions don't exist on their own. They have to be part of a neutral ionic compound. And so uh, that's why the net ionic equation, although it shows what really happens, it leaves out the other parts of the ionic compounds that were originally there, even though they weren't involved in the reaction. So that was one type of uh, double replacement reaction called a precipitation reaction. Another type of double replacement reaction is called a neutralization. And the general form of a neutralization is that a, a compound known as, an, known as an acid reacts with another compound that's known as a base, and they produce a salt and water. So we think of salt as sodium chloride, that's table salt. But a salt is also a word that means any ionic compound that does not have hydroxide ion in it. And the reason why it excludes compounds that have hydroxides is because compounds that have hydroxides are called bases instead. And then in terms of acids, we talked about acids last week. You can tell an acid because it has uh, an H in front. And remember, acids behave kind of like ionic compounds, where the positive ion is H+, plus, and the negative ion is just whatever's in the acid there. So uh, just like before here, um, we're going to want to identify what's happening in these reactions. So uh, what I'm going, what I want to do first is point out how will you recognize that this is a neutralization reaction. Well, what you're going to see is you're going to see an acid, which you'll recognize because the H is there. And then you're going to see a base, which you'll recognize because there's a hydroxide there. So when you have the acid and the base, you know you're going to have a neutralization reaction. And so what you do is you do some work here. And so our work again goes down here. It's not a part of our answer. And we identify here that we're going to have an acid. So that's going to have H plus ions in it. And then the other ion is a polyatomic ion. You should have this memorized from last week. It's going to be the nitrate ion, NO3 minus. This is nitric acid. Nitric acid because it has nitrate ion in it. And then here, the positive ion in this one is going to be, well, it's group one metal, K here. And so it will make a plus one ion. And so this is going to be the K plus ion. And then the negative ion here is hydroxide, OH minus. And so what's going to go on here is that the H plus is going to react and go with the OH minus here. And the NO3 is going to react and go with the K plus. And so the question is, what is our products here? Well, our products are going to be, we're going to write them now. It's going to be a product that has the K plus ion in it and the NO3 minus ion. Uh, and so that's positive one and negative one, so we can simply write the compound. Uh, it's going to be KNO3. And this is soluble in water, so it's aqueous. We could write aqueous here. Um, and then the other product, and here's what's new about this, is that the other product is made from H plus and OH minus. And here's what you have to remember about neutralizations. When H plus ion goes with OH minus ion, that makes the product H2O, water. So this is what's new about uh, neutralization reactions. At this point, we would, uh, and this is liquid, we would say L for liquid here, L for liquid. 
and these are both aqueous as well. We can put those in there, aqueous, aqueous. And note again, all this down here is your work, okay? Your answer, your answer is right here. This is your answer, or what I have here. This is your answer, okay? I've rewritten it right here. Notice it has no charges in it. Your answer shouldn't have any charges in it. If you're writing, you know, a bunch of charges in your answers uh, on experiment four, for example, you're going to get a bad score. Okay. Also, it's it is important. Also, in experiment four, you'll be including the phases. These are both soluble. It's aqueous. This is aqueous. This is liquid. Okay. And so we picked out here the yellow arrows were all about picking out the H plus and the OH minus. Then we see that so those got together, they make water. Uh, and then the salt is made from the positive ion from the base and the negative ion from the acid. So that's how you got this salt, KNO3. And then the H plus and the OH minus made the water. So this is a kind of double replacement reaction, but what's special about neutralization reactions, again, is that the H plus from the acid combines with the hydroxide from the base, and that makes water. So that's what makes this a special type of double replacement reaction. By the way, acid-base reactions, super important. Uh, we'll, talk a we'll have a whole chapter about acids and bases later on, and we'll talk more about why they're so important, but acid-base reactions, types of reactions happen all the time in, in uh, uh, biological chemistry, organic chemistry. Also, your stomach has, uh, has acid in it, uh, which is neutralized by eating bases like antacids. Uh, so these are really important chemistry to the body as well and to industry as well. So here's another example. The answer is down here, but let's talk about how we would get to the answer. Okay. Uh, so the way your question is going to be composed is like we see at the top. Again, you have to predict what the products will be. Uh, but you do your same old double switch. So you notice we've been doing the same old double switch where we look at and see, okay, what is, what is the positive ion here, okay? Uh, the positive ion is it's a metal. It's calcium. We can tell this is ionic because calcium is a metal. So we look to see where calcium is. It's in group two, it's fixed charge. Uh, so it is positive two. Oh, my, my uh, NVIDIA driver is downloading. Okay, uh, all right. And so uh, that has a charge of two plus. Now in terms of hydroxide, again, this one, you better have it memorized in your brain, especially this one, it's OH minus. And we've got two of them. But that's not really important to us right now. Remember, what's important to us is we need to be able to write the formulas for the ionic compounds first. We don't care much about the subscripts right now. We'll deal with that when we're balancing the equation, but that doesn't happen until the very end. Okay, and here now uh, for our positive ion, this is an acid. We can tell because it has an H in the front. And so we're gonna write that ion as H plus. And then the negative ion here, is uh, bromine. It's a monatomic negative ion. So we go to see what the charge would be. Oh, for a monatomic bromide ion, it's negative one uh, here. So we're going to write the charge negative one. Okay. And now we do our double switch. The positive ion of the first compound goes with the negative ion of the second. And then the negative ion of the first compound goes with the positive ion of the second. Notice, we just keep doing the same thing. We write out what the ions are, and we do our double switch. That's what a double replacement reaction is. And all of these are just various types of double replacement reactions. So now we can get rid of this question mark. We're going to know what this is now. But make, make sure you cancel your charges in your compound. So I'm going to write the ions that are going to be in my compound, it's going to be calcium 2 plus for the positive ion, and it's going to be Br minus for the negative ion. Now again, we're not paying attention to subscripts here. This doesn't matter. All that matters is the charges. We must cancel the charge. So if we have a second bromide ion, this will give us two negatives to go with our two positives. So our ionic compound here must be CaBr2. Uh, and bromides are generally soluble, right? Uh, 
they're generally soluble. These are both sol uh, soluble. Hydroxide, soluble. Um, uh, acids are generally soluble as well. Uh, so here, calcium bromide. Uh, it is a bromide. Uh, bromide and chlorides are generally soluble with the exception of silver bromide, lead 2 bromide, and mercury 2 bromide. So this is soluble, so we could say aqueous here. Next, we, our other product, and this is always the case with neutralizations, the other product is formed from H plus and OH minus. Again, do not, you do not care about this subscript. All you care about is making sure these charges cancel first. We'll deal with the subscripts when we balance, okay? So this is H plus and OH minus. What you have to memorize for neutralization reactions is, is that these make H2O. And since most of the solution is H2O, we'll call it liquid. It doesn't make sense to call H2O aqueous because that would mean water dissolved in water. But water is water, so we call it aqueous instead. Now, finally, we can balance, okay? Finally, we balance. Uh, we look for our calcium. We have one calcium on this side, one calcium on this side. We're good. I'm going to wait to balance my hydrogen because it appears in more than one spot. I'll balance bromine first. So here I have one times two, two bromines. But on this side, I only have one bromine. So I'm going to want to put a two right here, OK, to balance this. Now in terms of oxygen, my oxygens on the left are one times two times one. That's two oxygens. So on the right, I want to have two oxygens, so I would put a two here. Uh, in terms of hydrogen, I have one times two times one, that's two hydrogens, plus two times one, that's another two hydrogens, four hydrogens on the left. Two times two, that's four hydrogens. So finally, I have my answer. It's the same as we have written down here. And again, the way this works is the positive ion from the base goes with the negative ion from the acid make sure the charges cancel uh, oh minus and h plus make water and make sure the sum of the charges is zero so just to go back see how we put two bromides to make sure the sum of the charges was zero that's super important okay it, you can't do any balancing don't worry about any subscripts until your charges cancel because you have to have the correct subscripts here before you can even think about balancing so what if there's two hydroxides over here? That doesn't matter. What matters is that our charge is canceled. Then we can deal with the fact that we don't have the right number. We must cancel our charges. Make sure to your sum of charges equals zero. And one last example here. We have potassium hydroxide. We can tell as a base because it has hydroxide. And we have uh, sulfuric acid. And these uh, make water here. Uh, so again, we do the same old double switch here. We write out what ions we've got. We've got potassium ion that is in group one, positive one. We've got hydroxide ion here. Then our positive ion is H plus here. And our negative ion is polyatomic. Hopefully you have this one up in your head. It's sulfate, SO4 two minus. We're going to do our good old double switch. The potassium here is going to go with the sulfate. And so we can write them out now. Uh, and we're going to fill in the, the rest here. K plus going with SO4 2 minus. Okay, we got to make sure our, our charges must sum to zero. Right now they are not summing to zero. So we need another K plus. That will give us two positives to go with our two negatives. So now we can write the formula K2SO4. And again, this is all our work here. Notice the answer has no charges in it. The other product here has an H plus and an OH minus. These together make water. Notice I haven't balanced yet, right? Don't balance until the end, the very end. Make sure your charges are canceling and then you can balance. So here I can see I have two potassiums. Whoops, I'd like to have two potassiums on the other side. So I will put a two here. And then uh, I'll have for my uh, 
hydrogens. I've got two times one, two hydrogens, plus one times two, two more. So I'd like to have four. So I put a two here, that gives me four. Then I have one sulfate, one sulfate using tip three there. And then two times one, two other oxygens, two times one, two other oxygens. Okay, I'm balanced now. And so that's how you do neutralization. So we've covered now precipitation reactions and neutralization reactions. We have one more type of reaction left to cover, and it is called a gas evolution reaction. So if, if you do your double switch, and at the end, you get a product that is either carbonic acid, sulfurous acid, or ammonium hydroxide, it turns out that these products are unstable in water and they will decompose to produce other things, uh, gases. So carbonic acid in water decomposes to produce CO2 in water. So in your soda, for example, in the soda water, you know they say soda is acidic. They say soda is acidic because it has carbon dioxide dissolved in the water and that makes uh, that makes um, that comes from carbonic acid dissolved in water. So when it comes out of solution, it releases CO2 in water. Um, sulfurous acid here decomposes into SO2 and water. And ammonium hydroxide decomposes into ammonia and water, or NH3 as it, ammonia as it's called. So after you've done your double switch. What you need to do is pay attention to the products and see, do they contain any of these? If they contain one of these three, you're not done yet. So you definitely want to have these in your notes and handy so you can remind yourself, if I have one of these products, I'm not done yet. And I'll show you an example here. If we have sodium carbonate, okay, and, we, and hydrochloric acid, and we wanted to determine the products, well, we'd do our good old double switch here. So we'd say, okay, the positive ion here is Na plus 1. The negative ion is carbonate, CO3 2 minus. Here, this is an acid, so the positive one is H plus, and the negative ion is chloride ion. So then we do our double switch. The Na plus goes with the chloride, and the carbonate goes with the H plus. And so over here, our ions are H plus and carbonate. Well, we've got two negatives here on our carbonate and only one positive on our H plus. So we'll need one more H plus. And so we write down the formula now, H2CO3. Then for the other product, it's Na plus and Cl minus. Now, again, a lot of people are gonna go and look at this two and they're gonna wanna write a two next to this sodium. No, that's not right because Sodium is positive one, chloride is negative one. You're done. Your charges are already canceling. The way you fix this is after you've written all this, now we can balance. So we see two sodiums over here. Okay, now we go and balance and write a two here to give us two times one, two sodiums. Okay, now we have two chlorines over here. Okay, now we go and write a two right here to balance to give us two chlorines. Then we have one carbonate, one carbonate, two times one, two hydrogens, two hydrogens. Okay, we're balanced. Now we may think, oh great, we're all done, but you've got to watch out. What we've got is a gas evolution product here. So this is not going to remain the same. Instead, we've got to take that, cross it out, and replace it with what we've got here. So we're going to replace that with now with CO2 and water. And this is now the correct answer. So uh, that's one extra step you have to do is that if you get one of these three products, you have to erase what you put there and replace it with its actual products, CO2 gas and liquid water. And then you get the right answer. So this, this right here is the correct answer. Okay. So the way these problems are going to look is like this. You're going to get an example here of reactants and you're going to have to try to determine what the products will be and to balance the equation. And so these are going to be the rest of your homework problems. It's also going to be what most of experiment four is about. And I just have to fix my monitor cable. My cats are pulling on it and messing it up so I can't see my other screen.
There we go. Okay. So, all right. Um, so again, the way we handle this every time, no matter whether we, we've got, we won't know right away. Do we have a precipitation? Do we have a neutralization? Do we have a gas evolution? We won't know right away. We've got to figure that out. So the way we do that is we do our good old double switch. And so we write out the name of the, pos uh, the, the identity of the positive ion. This is calcium. Again, calcium is group two, so it makes positive two ions. By the way, if you're feeling confident here, you can pause before I start and pause now and try it yourself. I'm going to continue in just three, two, one. All right. Uh, and so now for uh, the other ion, it's going to be a bromide ion. So the negative ion here is bromide. Okay. There are two of them, yes, but I don't care right now. I just care about what the ion is. I'm not paying attention to this just yet. I just need to make sure my charges cancel first, okay? Uh, and then on this compound here, it's going to be silver ion. Silver is always fixed charge, so remember your fixed charge metals here. Uh, don't forget those. Fixed charge is like right in here. And silver is always positive one. These are positive two and so forth. So silver here is positive one. Fixed charge, positive one. And nitrate is, that's a polyatomic ion. You have to have it in your brain now. Do you see why I want you to memorize these? Because if you don't have them memorized, you're going to be really slow. Uh, and you might not be fast enough to finish your exams and quizzes. In my live classes, I always make students memorize the, the polyatomic ions. Okay, so now we do our double switch. The positive ion of the first compound goes with the sec negative ion of the second. The negative ion of the first compound goes with the positive ion of the second. And it doesn't matter which one we write first or second. I'll write the, the calcium and the nitrate first. So calcium is positive 2. Nitrate is negative 1. We need to make sure that our charges cancel. We've got two positives. Go with one negative here. So we have... We need one more of these. That will give us two negatives to go with our two positives. So now we write out the, the charge neutral ionic compound. It's one calcium and two nitrates. So we put a parentheses around the NO3 with a two on the outside. And now we've got one other product here. It's going to be made from the silver ions and the bromide ions. Silver is positive one, bromide is negative one. We write silver bromide. Again, I must emphasize, you do not write a two here. A two does not belong here because these charges are already canceled. It doesn't matter that there's a two over here. That's not what we're doing here. We're first making sure our charges cancel. Then we can deal with balancing. Uh, first, we should try to get our phases here. Uh, so to do this, we're going to have to use our ionic solubility rules. Uh, according to the ionic solubility rules, nitrates are always soluble. And, and so uh, this is going to be aqueous. Now also, according to our solubility rules, bromides are generally soluble, with the exception of silver bromide, lead 2 bromide, and mercury 1 bromide. So this is not soluble. This is going to be a solid. So uh, this is a precipitation type reaction. Precipitation uh, because a solid is being produced. Lastly, we should balance this. Uh, so we have on the left side, one times two bromines over here. And so we want two bromines on the right. We'll put a two here, we have two times one. And that gives us two silvers, two times one. So we're going to want two silvers on the left. So we put a two there. And then we've got one calcium, one calcium. Then we have two nitrates and two nitrates. Okay, so we're done. And what's really important is that this in the black box is your answer. I do not want to see any ions uh, with charges in your answer, okay? Your results are neutral ionic compounds. 
okay? All of this is work. It belongs on the side or on scratch paper somewhere. This is the answer. No charges. No charges in the answer. No charges in neutral ionic compounds in your answer. And that's really important. If I'm seeing charges up in here, I'm going to be marking it wrong. If the subscripts are not right, it's going to be wrong, okay? Uh, there's a lot to do in these problems, so we're really building up to doing real chemistry now. Okay, next, uh, let's identify uh, what's in here. So this is an acid. We can tell because there's an H in the front. Um, okay. So let's go ahead and identify the ions in this acid. Of course, the positive ion is always H plus. The negative ion is always Cl minus, or is Cl minus here, it's chloride ion, okay? Uh, and then next, the positive ion in this one is sodium. Sodium is in group one here. Chlorine is in group seven, so that's why it was negative one. Sodium is group one, it's positive one. So plus one. And Sure, there are two of them here, but we don't care. That's not what we're looking at. We're trying to figure out what the ions are. Finally, uh, our polyatomic ion here is sulfite. You should have that one memorized. This is sodium sulfite, hydrochloric acid. All right, and so now we're gonna do our good old double switch again. Oop, oop. And oop, 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 that should be blue. Oop. Okay. So our product here is going to be uh, H, uh, I'm going to actually write the acid second just to give myself more room. Uh, I'm going to write the blue one first. It doesn't matter which one you write first or second. It's going to be Na plus and Cl minus. These are already canceling charges, so we can simply write NaCl. Again, no charges here. And since this has a group one positive ion, it's aqueous, dissolves in water. Next, our other compound is going to be composed of H plus ions for the positive ion and sulfite ions for the negative ion. We've got two negatives, only one positive, so we're going to need another H plus ion. And so that's going to give us the acid sulfurous acid, H2SO3. It's an acid, so we write aqueous. Now, this is, this is where it's difficult. You have to go and look back and see, oh man, this is one of my gas evolution products, okay? What I'm going to do is I'm going to balance this first and then I'm going to deal with that. So uh, in terms of sodium, I've got two sodiums over here, but only one over here. So now I balance. Notice how I always balance last. Balancing is the last thing you do. So I got two times one, two sodiums. I've also got two chlorines now here, so I'm gonna have, gonna have to have two over here. So I put it two, two times one, that's two chlorines. Uh, two times one, that's two hydrogens. One times two, two hydrogens. We have one sulfide here and one sulfide. So we're all balanced. So finally now, uh, we recognize this because H2SO3 is a product, we're now going to cross this out and we're going to replace it with its gas evolution products, which are H2SO3 makes SO2 and water. So we're going to cross that out. Whoops. And we're going to replace that with SO2 gas and water. Or you can erase it too if you want it to be nice and clean. Okay. And now we're all done. This is a gas evolution reaction. And then last, uh, I can probably tell right away this is a neutralization reaction. I can tell because I have an acid, I know since there's an H in front, and I have a base, I know since there's a hydroxide. So this, is, this last one's gonna be a neutralization reaction. And we're going to write out the ions and do our double switch as usual. This is an acid, so the positive ion is H+. 
The negative ion is polyatomic. It's the carbonate ion, CO3, 2 minus. The positive ion here is sodium plus 1, like in some of the previous problems. And the negative ion is hydroxide. Now time to do the good old double switch. And so one of my products here is going to have sodium ions and carbonate ions. Uh, so since the carbonate is negative 2 and the sodium is only positive 1, we're going to need another sodium ion. So now we can write our product. It's going to be two sodiums, one carbonate. So sodium carbonate there. And since this has a group 1 positive ion, which is sodium, it is always soluble. So that is aqueous. And now finally, uh, we're, our other product is going to be the, the product that has H plus and OH minus, which is always water. So we write that water, and that's, we don't say water is aqueous, we just say it's liquid. It's an L. And then finally, we balance, uh, we balance sodium here, two sodiums over here. So I would want two sodiums here, so I write a two. And uh, then for oxygen, I have, uh, well, I have one carbonate. I'm not going to include that. I'll count the other oxygens. Two times one, two oxygens. So if I put a two here, I'll have two oxygens, two times one. Then my hydrogens are two times two, that's four. Here I have one times two, that's two. And then two times one, that's another two, or four. So we're balanced now. And so uh, for this week, what you have for the rest is a lot of practice with doing this. This is the kind of thing that takes a lot of practice. So make sure uh, you, know, you get going on that. Uh, Experiment 4 is going to be great for practicing. It's also going to be great to see some videos of some of these um, you know, neutralization, precipitation, and gas evolution reactions in, in, in a video so you can see what they really look like. And so uh, good luck on your practicing. Let me know if you get stuck. Please come to office hours. We've got our usual three office hours this week. Uh, and make sure to practice very well for this. Uh, it, it, you've got a lot to practice this week. And so make sure to let me know if you need help or get stuck. And um, I will see you in the next video. I just got to get my video back here after my cats killed it. And then I'll uh, stop the video. So I'll see you guys later.